Pink Floyd were original. I mean, this, the, the sound was, was unique. They sold more records than virtually anyone else in the world or something ridiculous like that. But at the same time, they're incredibly obscure and stuff. They became the spokespeople of disappointment. I like the jokes and the twists and the... I mean, the rage that comes out of their songs is really extraordinary. They were the Pink Floyd and above and beyond category. Those sounds were made by the Pink Floyd of them more hereafter. In 1985, Roger Waters, founder member of Pink Floyd, handed in his resignation. For those who weren't up on the band's history, it may have signaled the end, but the band had survived the loss of a key member once before. Nineteen sixty five and the story so far. Roger Waters and Sid Barrett went to school together in Cambridge. When Waters went to London to study architecture at the Regent Street Polytechnic, he teamed up with two fellow students, Rick Wright and Nick Mason. Sid Barrett was later brought in as lead singer. They became known as the Pink Floyd. The black and green scarecrow as everyone knows. Spring of 66, I was attached to the training department of what was then British European Airways. And the only nice thing about it was 5% flights at the weekends. And the chap who became my partner, Peter Jenner, was teaching at the LSE and he was bored with that. And we were involved in all the sort of things which were going on at that time, the happenings, you know, the early days of swinging London. And I thought, well, you know, the thing to do would be to manage a rock band. And I heard about the Pink Floyd, and I thought, that's the one to manage. As for the band themselves, you had a tough cookie in Roger, a man who, if he hadn't been in, in rock and roll, I'm sure would have been an enormously successful architect. You had Nick with a wonderful showbiz instinct, and Rick giving it the basis of the musical skills. And you had a genius in Sid, so it, it was a lucky combination. I first heard of the Pink Floyd in, I guess it was the summer of 66, when uh, Peter Jenner uh, brought me a tape. And subsequently, I went to see them in Power Square at the London Free School, which was a rather idealistic Notting Hill Gate organization. And the idea was there was going to be a free school, which anyone could go to and learn all about exciting things like Gnostic religions and um, how to grow in your own magic mushrooms and we thought the Pink Floyd should play there so they did. Powys Gardens was important because it was the first time that we were booked in our own name and uh, actually drew a crowd on that name. I brought record company people down and I was stunned that they couldn't see it exactly. People were interested but they weren't exactly falling all over themselves and I thought this is obvious, this is great, this is going to be, you know, this is a hit. Inspired by the kind of audience he encountered at Pink Floyd gigs, Joe Boyd, together with his partner John Hopkins, set up a monthly venue called the UFO Club. Joe asked me to do posters for the UFO Club in the Tottenham Court Road, which met on Friday nights. And um, I suppose it was the sort of first uh, acid house uh, rock uh, venue. And the Floyd were the resident band. time we were doing these endless shows in places like the top rank Grimsby or the California Ballroom Dunstable where the audience actually hated what we did but UFO was the one area where people were interested in what we were doing and it sort of kept us alive in a way kept it, there did seem some point in carrying on I have to say we were very experimental 
by the time we got to UFO Club, we were playing whatever we felt like. And uh, it seemed to me we actually played quite a lot of rubbish. <laughs> If I first may turn to Roger, why has it all got to be so terribly loud? For me, frankly, it's too loud. I just can't bear it. I happen to have grown up in the string quartet, which is a bit soft for Well, I don't guess it has to be, but I mean, that's the way we like it. And uh, we didn't grow up with a string quartet, and I guess that could be one of the reasons. Yes, actually, not everybody who hasn't grown up in a string quartet turns into a loud pop group, so your reason is not altogether convincing. <laughs> I remember them best as uh, in those early days. You know, performing down at the UFO with the light shows projecting onto them, and um, we were all spaced. <laughs> there were lights everywhere. The kind of the oil solution that was then refracted through a projector, which made these designs that sort of covered over the group as they were playing. The light techniques they're using now are the result of five years' research by an architect, Mike Leonard, at work here on his new light projector. The work goes on in a house in Highgate in London. They were looking for somewhere to uh, some accommodation. I said, well, why don't you shift into the, into the basement because uh, plenty of room at the moment, you know. The most important start point for the light show was Mike Leonard and the Hornsey College of Art. That was a sort of idea that the music could be um, improvised and the lighting could be improvised to go with it. I'd just been playing around with uh, making light machines and I started a first embryonic sort of light machine which was really discs with coloured patterns pushed through optical devices which gave you quite a wide range of, uh, of images. Another experiment aims at a more controlled relation between sound and image. Providing the music, a group which features a range of unusual sound effects, the Pink Floyd. It was quite funny because we were living with Michael Leonard, our tutor, and he wanted to be in the band, and we and there's no way we want him in the band. I look a bit like I am now, you know, about the same sort of presence and. Um, Short of actually hiring a wig or something, I mean, I couldn't, I don't think how anybody would have actually really accepted me. That's the way things go, you know. If you're born 15 years too late, you uh, miss out. Sid, yeah. At that time, he wasn't crazy like the diamond at all, you know. He was just a very always a friendly, humorous guy, always a little chuckle and a laugh, you know, I liked him a lot. He's a nice bloke, Sin. He was absolutely delightful. Uh, at the time when it was considered fashionable to be rather cool, and uh, no one introduced anyone to anyone else, so that you could spend whole parties just addressing people as man. And Sid was someone who'd sort of come up and say, hi, I'm Sid, and so on. I mean, he was a really easygoing, outgoing personality. He was a very good painter, he was a very good actor, he was a lovely, handsome boy with lots of girlfriends. You couldn't think of a more well-rounded, integrated, happy bloke. I remember when Sid joined the band, he had all these incredible ideas, lyrically and musically. Very strange and very childish in a way, some of his stuff. I mean, it's kind of fairy, fairy tales and all this stuff, but totally unique. I'd never heard anything like it, and it was fabulous. He bought the ability to play the guitar, which was quite unusual at that time. Um, we, I suppose also he bought the ability to, to perform, um, and eventually, I mean, obviously not immediately, but eventually he bought songwriting. <laughs> into the studio to do Arnold Lane. They gave him time. Yeah. 
and we did it pretty much, I think, in about, I think, one day for recording. It was four tracks. That was the facilities, was four tracks at, the, at that time. So we had to record all the rhythm section onto one track, and then we overdubbed a few other things. <laughs> It was banned by Radio London because uh, it had references to transvestitism and also to nicking underwear. But we hyped it a bit with a gentleman whose name I wouldn't dream of revealing, who in those days could enable you to improve your chart position for comparatively small expenditure. We managed to hype it to 21. <laughs> Sounds a little naive, but I think I was probably unaware of the politics of Joe Boyd going on over that period because, of course, what happened was Joe Boyd was the initial um, producer and then was really rode out when we signed with EMI. Basically, I think we felt, let's be on the same label as the Beatles. So we signed with EMI. Once they did the deal with EMI, EMI had a policy in those days of their own studios, their own producers. Once you signed to EMI, you were in-house. And so I was very much shut out. It's interesting that it didn't occur to us to make a fuss about who was going to produce us. We didn't say, no, that's our decision, it's nothing to do with you. We said, yes, okay, we sort of gave in. To work at Abbey Road in those days was um, Wonderful experience. I was just very, very excited. Doing your first album, putting down your music onto tape, and knowing that the Beatles are next door, doing Sgt. Pepper. Because I was a bit of a snob before then. I was a real jazz, a jazzo. And uh, I didn't really believe that pop music meant anything at all. But when I heard Sgt. Pepper, it changed my attitude to what people like us could do. Their follow-up single, See Emily Play, reached number six in the charts and was closely followed by the album Piper at the Gates of Dawn. The Floyd were on their way. Emily tries but misunderstands. Sid Barrett turned out to be one of the great English songwriters of the late 1960s. I mean, if you listen to Piper at the Gates of Dawn now, it's, it almost makes you cry what a great talent was lost there. <laughs> The Floyd agreed to come back in May and play a sort of farewell gig at UFO. And the news that the Floyd were playing meant that it was absolutely jammed. There were queues around the block. And I was standing there counting money and taking tickets and overseeing the, the, the door. And, and, um, and the Floyd arrived and they had to sort of squeeze past me. And so everyone was like, hi, Joe, how are you? And they were all passing very close to my face. And Sid was the last one in. And I'll never forget that because he, I just looked him right in the eye as he went right past me. And it was as if somebody had just flicked the switch out. And that light that had always been in his eyes and that glint, that mischievous look was just gone. It was a chemical problem. I mean, he took too many drugs in a very short space of time. Not so long after that, they got Dave Gilmore to come in and play behind him to sort of fill in for when Sid wasn't playing. I had known Sid since I was about 14. It was hard dealing with sort of replacing one of my close friends and, uh, and having to see one of my close friends who is no longer sort of functioning as a normal human being. I have a lot of sympathy with the band at that time, which other people don't necessarily have, but I do because I was there. And that was that if a member of the band is literally playing a different tune, it gets quite hard. I mean, there was no way, if you like, would the band wanted to or had any reason to, because if you think about it, it's kind of artistic and commercial suicide to lop off your you know, vital creative juices. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Well, we're all very close to him. It was very difficult because we had decided at this point that what we wanted to do was Sid become rather like a Brian Wilson, if you like, and stay at home and write. Because we knew by then it was impossible, he couldn't perform on stage. So I had to say things like, Sid, I'm going out to get some cigarettes. 
and then go off and do a gig and come back the next day. And it was awful. I mean, it was a terrible time. Eventually, of course, he understood what was happening. The band separated from their management, Andrew King and Peter Jenner, who had no faith in a Pink Floyd without Barrett. They felt, and I think with some justification, that uh, Sid was the talent that they'd discovered and that they would stick with him. And that if we didn't want to work with Sid, well, that was, that was the way it would go. Which, which um, from, from most outsiders, would have seen that as a, a sensible decision to make, I think. We did, I think, five gigs with both Sid and I in the band together. Sid sort of, I, he seemed to cheer up a little bit when I was there. Um, I guess maybe it took some pressure off him, and I sort of learnt up the parts like the record and played them, and sometimes Sid, Sid sang a bit and sometimes he didn't. And, but um, it was obviously not going to be... It, I mean, it became very obvious that it wasn't going to continue for very long like that and on I think it must have been the sixth one that we would have done together which I think was at Southampton University um, we just never picked him up someone said shall we pick up Sid and someone said nah let's not bother and that was the end David Gilmour assumed a permanent role in the band as lead singer in 1968. The band got me in to be a front person, yes, I mean, to cover Sid's parts. I suspect at the time mostly to try and, you know, eke out our career a little bit longer. I learnt to sing all Sid's parts and play his guitar parts, more or less. My guitar style and Sid's guitar style were not even close, so it was uh, very difficult to know exactly what to do. It took a while for me to settle in. Back in the past, in the uh, very early days, we tried to have hit singles. There was one called Apples and Oranges. Down by the riverside, feeding ducks in the afternoon time. Anyway, there were a number of attempts, and it, it became quite clear that we just were no bloody good at it. Just as they were getting weird, you could notice the transition point on Saucer Full of Secrets. There's a couple of really brilliant songs, like Set the Controls to the Heart of the Sun. That's always quite a charming thing in music when, when you can tell that an artist is kind of reaching beyond what they actually know how to do to do something else. Their next album, Uma Guma, continued that trend, with each band member taking half an LP side each to indulge their own musical tastes. I think Uma Guma was a, in a way a, probably a failed experiment and quite an interesting one. Well, we all bought on the gun, we all listened to it, but I mean, you can't really listen to it now. It's very, very self-indulgent and a bit, a bit hopeless, most of it. You could say the significant thing was that we didn't do it again. What we tended to do was blunder from one moment to the next, and uh, films were something we blundered into. I'm not the man to talk about the musical direction. I always think the musical direction of the band might be likened to four drunks wrestling for control of a car wheel. I was asked to do Atom Heart Mother. Um, I suppose because Roger could see that I could work. I wasn't a nut, you know, I'm a craftsman and I crafted Atom Heart Mother. It was already a complete piece before um, Ron came on the scene and uh, we decided to get him to do some orchestrations. I 
At that time, EMI had just moved on to eight track recorders with two inch tape. And no one had actually cut the tape at that point. Um, it was considered that maybe there would be problems if it was edited. Consequently, Roger and I had to do the backing tracks in one pass. It was a 23 minute piece, something like that. We probably took about the third take where we actually got all the way through it because it was so difficult for us to remember where the hell we were in the piece. Um, so from then on, the thing in some ways went downhill. Some of the rhythms didn't match up. You know, you, you know how you've got to, if you're going to speed up, you've actually got to continue speeding up. Or if you're going to slow down, then it's got to be a very, very definite place to slow down, not just anywhere. For any orchestra or anyone having to conduct it, it must have been an absolute nightmare. I think the whole thing was a bit of a mishmash myself. Um, the, the brass section that we used were not very experienced at recording. Plus the fact that I was cracking up just down to pressure of work and not being able to handle hard brass players who can be vicious. If Atom Heart Mother in itself was a more structured piece or if there was some way of pulling it out, I'd still love to perform something like that again, just the vocal section. Um, I, I'm sort of less, less fond of the, the brass parts for it. I wouldn't dream of performing anything that embarrassed me. If somebody said to me now, right, you know, here's a million pounds, go out and play Atom Heart Mother, I'd say you must be joking. The metal album, to me, is the point where it all started falling into place. The Echoes piece itself, sort of 25 minutes long, going through all sorts of different moments, all of which are, are, are really good. So, yeah, that's, uh, that was leading the way towards Dark Side of the Moon. In the early 1970s, they underwent an extraordinary transformation, and I think this was, this was really down to Roger Waters and Dave Gilmore between them, really starting to get serious, in a way, about what they were about. They matured musically, and then, of course, they released Dark Side of the Moon, which changed the world. And Dark Side was the first piece where we really, I think, planned it out from you know, the start to the finish. We all were quite convinced that uh, we were moving into a slightly different league, I suppose you could say. And after all, we're only ordinary men. It's very easy to see Dark Side as a turning point now, but if, at the time, it was just the next album we were working on. The voices, they were great, they were brilliant. That was Roger, he just came up with a series of questions about aggression, violence, um, lunacy, death, uh, and they were placed in a certain order on a music stand in front of a microphone and they were supposed to read the question, answer it, then take the piece of paper off and uh, answer the next one. They weren't allowed to look through, so the, some of the questions were leading them on to other things. Um, and we did the Irish doorman. At, uh, at Abbey Road Studios, Jerry, and um, some of our roadies. I am not frightened of dying. Any time will do, I don't mind. Why should I be frightened of dying? There's no reason for it. You've got to do something. I think they just had this track that Rick Wright had written a chord sequence and they'd done a bit of boop, 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 boop and things, you know. And I think it was just an, a thought, well, maybe we'd have a vocal on it and, and we'll see how it goes. So 
I listened to it and uh, I sort of thought to myself, what the hell do I do? I had no idea. Somewhere in the back of my mind, it crossed quickly that perhaps I should pretend that I was an instrument. I don't really think they had any more idea than I had. I think it was just an experiment. I mean, all the way through the making of it, we, we thought we were onto something that was going to do a bit better than anything we had previously done. And, uh, and when that came together with the record cover and everything at the end, we were all pretty excited. Dark Side of the Moon was one of seven images I did for that particular cover. And I laid them all around a little room. It took them three seconds. They went, that one, and they all did it. So it must be right. Because it done and I said, well, can we, you know, can we talk about some of the other work? I really spent a long time. What about the silver survey? What about this over here? What about that? And they said, hmm, interesting, but we like that one. And I and trooped out. Obviously, I feel terribly proud that um, little bit that I thought of, or rather, that I nicked from a physics book and embellished slightly. But it was more you know, the idea of having it. I feel very gratified by it. But it's only a prism. It's only a piece of white light going through a prism. Roger Waters provided them with a kind of theatrical and conceptual framework. And Dave Gilmore, I believe, with you know, the assistance of the others, but principally him, provided them with a kind of musical edge. Roger was the pushiest person, certainly. He was the, the main driving force behind what was going on, yes. The most remarkable thing was the way that he did take over when Sid left. I mean, his one song on Piper at the Gates of Dawn is not a great song, but he applied himself to becoming a songwriter and became a terrific one. I think Roger had a good balance at the time. He had a good balance of passion and intelligence. But set against that is the fact that Dave's guitar work, in contradistinction to all the other aspects of Floyd you think about, is actually very, very lyrical and very melodic. Everyone thinks that the best of our moments are the moments where, I do anyway, think that the best of our moments are when the best of Roger and his lyric and idea and driving force came together with some of my more melodic and emotional moments that sort of fall out of my guitar and things once in a while. Certainly, the Wish You Were Here album on China and Your Crazy Diamonds are sort of sublime moments for me, anyway. The starting point for China and Your Crazy Diamond is almost the same as the starting point for the whole of music itself. That being the harmonic series, the starting point for China and Your Crazy Diamond is a very extended chord of G minor 7. So extended, in fact, it lasts for two and a half minutes without a change. Well, when you first hear it, and in particular, you know, the, the opening of, uh, of Shine On Your Crazy Diamond, and there really seems to be damn all going on. How do they do this? How do they keep your interest for two and a half minutes? I think the reason is, being, having trained as architecture students, they have a very clear sense of what to do with a line in a space. Roger was very, very good at timing, at that kind of timing. He's not particularly good at playing rhythms, but he's good at saying, now. That's the time, now. As simple as that. So, in the first section, we get the actual keyboard, just setting the scene, you know, as if you're walking into a building, you see the sort of transparent curtain of G minor, and it sets it up beautifully. Then the sort of slow lyrical guitar coming, on, coming in from Dave. The guitar's picking it up, so welcome. We get the first chord change, two and a half minutes in. And you're at about sort of five minutes in before very much happens at all. And we get that, an incredibly strong structural moment. It came out of the, uh, the little guitar arpeggio figure, the da dee dee ding thing, which sort of fell out of my guitar at the rehearsal studio. 
and I, when you when something does that you sort of repeat it over and over trying to sort of see why it's attractive to you and why, where you should take it and it, that set Roger off in a he loved it and that that's what sort of got the ball rolling I suppose you could say chord of C massive chord of C again remember we had C minor all of a sudden we have that that Guitar solo carries us through now to the actual vocal section. Talking about Sid Barrett, perhaps. You know, remember when you were young, you shone like the sun. Shine on you crazy diamond was not just a bunch of old hippies sort of bemoaning their youth. It was bemoaning somebody that they genuinely loved. It's an album which is plainly haunted by Sid Barrett, who quite coincidentally turned up while they were recording Shine On You Crazy Diamond. And this chap walked in and no one recognised him. And we've always argued about who spotted him first. <laughs> I naturally think I did. Um, <laughs> no one really knows. But there was a certain point where people were sort of nudging each other, going, bloody hell, that's Sid. And no one recognised him at all. It was a real shock because I hadn't seen him really since his breakdown when he was this very good looking guy and this is huge bloated guy of about 18 stone why would he turn up why well, would actually writing a song about him very strange he's still a part of the band in a way they still play shine on you crazy diamond first in the set everybody knows everyone who cares about pink floyd accept him as the fifth member i do think about him and i think about when we started and I, I have a, you know, it's a fantasy. I would love one day for Sid to walk into my room and so I'm ready to play in the band again. Nineteen seventy seven produced animals and an album cover that was to add to the Floyd mythology. The pig was a huge dirigible that was actually floated above Battersea Power Station and we had a marksman, okay, down to shoot it. Because if it were to escape this dirigible, then there could be what is called a rather large insurance claim. And we were all there, you know, the pig didn't go up. <laughs> I don't know why. We all came back the next day, but we decided not to bother with the marksman. So the pig went up the next day and escaped and it broke loose of a mooring rope. So, of course, the day we didn't have the marksman was the day the pig got out. <laughs> the pig got up and it went up in the air and um, was reportedly seen by various jet liners heading for Heathrow. It's not as broad an album, I suppose you could say, in appeal as some of the other ones have, but I like it a lot. I didn't really like much, a lot of it, a lot of the music on the album. I have to say, I didn't fight very hard to put my stuff on, and I didn't have anything to put on. I mean, I played on it, and I think I played well, but I didn't contribute to the writing of it. But I think also, Roger is kind of not letting me do that. This was the start of the whole ego thing, I think, in the band, Animals. <laughs> That year, the band took Animals on tour, culminating at Montreal's Olympic Stadium, where Roger Waters spat at a member of the audience. It was noisy, people were shouting, and he wanted them to listen to music, but you can't ask people to do that in a stadium of 50,000. They'd shout for what they wanted, or their favourite songs, or whatever. And you could, I mean, inevitably, and quite rightly, Roger was pretty distressed at the fact that they weren't listening to the music. And when he said he wanted to build a wall across the audience, I thought, this is absolutely insane. But he was right, and I was wrong. All in all, you're just a brick in the wall. And Roger had done a demo of the whole thing. Um, and it was excruciating to listen to, but you could tell instantly that there was a great idea in there. I was not somebody who particularly 
liked the idea of the wall. I thought that that was really pushing these ideas of alienation a bit too far. It's like enough already. Perfect isolation. At the time, I sort of bought, I bought it all. But since I've sort of, um, I have to say that my sort of reappraisal of it is, is, is that it's rather a whinge. Goodbye, cruel world. I'm leaving you today. During the recording of The Wall, Waters had become impatient with Rick Bright's apparent indifference. Holding the tapes of The Wall as ransom, he pushed Wright into resigning. I made a decision then, well, I can't work with this guy anymore anyway. I don't want to. I don't like this band anymore the way it is. And I left. There's nothing you can say to make me change my mind. Goodbye. Meantime, another brick in the wall got to number one. Hey! Teacher! The war was followed by the aptly titled Final Cut. By this time, relations between the band members had reached breaking point. It was torture to me. We really weren't getting on at all well. I felt that Roger was resurrecting tracks that we had not accepted for the Wall album. And I did say to him, they weren't good enough then, why are they good enough now? It got so difficult that uh, Roger wanted me to not have a say in what was going on on the production side of the album. So after a lot of arguing and umming and ahhing and soul searching, I agreed to come off the production credits. It was dreadful, really. It was dreadful. It's not the way a band should make records. And uh, I think we all thought that. Roger certainly thought it because he left the band shortly afterwards. <laughs> What I'm still conscious of are the 20 years of friendship and enjoyment we had together when the band was running along in a smoother way. And there's not many other people that I'd have rather had in the band. I thought that out there in record land that people did kind of identify me with quite a lot of the work that went into the Floyd. Um, but they don't. In 1987, Pink Floyd brought out their first post-Waters album, A Momentary Lapse of Reason. Its success marked a return to form. Richard Wright has rejoined the band. Their current album, The Division Bell, has already sold seven million copies. Sid Barrett now lives in Cambridge. According to his family, he doesn't like to talk about the past. As a consequence, the band haven't seen him since that day in Abbey Road. Roger Waters declined to be interviewed for this programme. His music career has not flourished since he left the band. At their concerts, Pink Floyd still play the songs he wrote. I have to accept that Pink Floyd is no longer like it used to be when Roger was in it. But the Pink Floyd is bigger than all of us. If we changed our name tomorrow to something completely different, I think it would not be easy for us. The elements that made Pink Floyd what it was, in whatever pinch of salt fragments these elements may be, Three of the four of the ones that have been part of it for the last 20-something years are still in there contributing. 